Hello everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, the dizzy new world of cyber investigations, law, ethics, and evidence. My name is Benjamin White with the SANS Institute, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Benjamin Wright. Uh, he's an attorney and a SANS uh, Institute instructor uh, for Legal 523. If you have any questions at any point throughout the webcast, please enter them into the questions window, and we'll ask them during the Q&A session at the end of the webcast. And with that, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Benjamin Wright. Hey, Ben, I think your uh, handset's muted. Can, can, I think okay. we can hear you now. Yep. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, Good. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, this is Benjamin Wright. I am uh, an attorney in Dallas, and I am honored to address this group on the topic of cyber investigations. I learn a lot about this topic by teaching a class at the SANS Institute titled The Law of Data Security and Investigations. And the way I learn is that I get a lot of smart students taking my class, and they tell me stories, and we interact through that class and debate about investigations and problems and challenges. And today, what I intend on covering are some major trends that I see related to cyber investigations from a legal and ethics perspective. I see the value and the risk associated with experimentation connected with cyber investigations. We're going to look a little, look a little bit at what I consider to be the rising accountability on professionals such as those of you who are listening in and what the implications are for rising accountability. We'll look at some ethics uh, rules that could apply to, to cyber investigations, look at some limitations on, on investigations, and finally we will uh, look at some ideas on, on how to manage risk and as we close uh, th this afternoon we'll take some questions and answers through the Q&A uh, box. As a technology lawyer who's been writing books and, and teaching uh, the law of data security and investigations for a number of years, I am struck by how digital evidence fuels a hunger in society and in law for more investigations. The authorities, whether it be courts, whether it be politicians, whether it be the public, calls for more investigations. We need to get more of, uh, knowledge of what's going on uh, so that we can better control what's happening in society. A really good example of this, this fuel for more investigations is the push to require many more police officers to, to have body cameras on. And there are very good reasons to expect police officers to have body cameras that record what they see and what they do uh, in their, their work. Uh, but it is a real change in police work to have police officers carrying a camera all the time recording what they're doing. Very big change from what we lived in in the 1980s and the 1990s or early uh, 2000s. And this trend toward more investigations, more digital evidence, is something that has implications way beyond just police work. I think that it has implications for all kinds of internal investigations at organizations, all kinds of investigations that uh, involve uh, a professional working for some kind of an enterprise uh, looking into allegations of corruption or human resources violations or violations of policy within an, an or organization. And so this fuel, this desire for more digital investigations, I think creates both opportunities and it creates risk for the professionals. So, so I'd like to, to uh, cover those ideas and, and uh, flesh that out a bit more. As I look at a modern investigator today evaluating all the places where evidence can be, it is just explosive to consider how much more evidence can be collected on any given event about any given person anytime there is an investigation. And the, the reason for this explosion is that we have so many new devices in our lives, in our workplace, out in public that are recording evidence 
that could be relevant to some kind of a lawsuit or some kind of a, a private investigation. And these new devices include, of course, security cameras, but it includes the new Apple Watch. I don't have one, so I can't uh, uh, demonstrate it, but uh, the Apple Watch is a new example of the, the Internet of Things, these, these uh, devices that are multiplying and, and populating our world, but they're capturing records, and those records can be relevant to a divorce, or they can be relevant to a, uh, a human resources investigation in an enterprise. Uh, other kinds of devices uh, and apps in include uh, smart meters, for example. A smart meter is a, a meter that, that sits on a building or it sits at a house and it monitors how much electricity is being used. It kinds of things that could be relevant to the use of electricity at a building. Well, this evidence that's being collected up in, in uh, the, the uh, smart meters and sent to the smart grid, all of this uh, plus the applications, the apps that, that manage this type of uh, uh, information can be very useful in an investigation. And it cre creates mountains of new evidence that did not exist in the old days. And therefore, I argue that uh, these, these opportunities for getting new evidence uh, give in all kinds of investigators the need to be creative and constantly ask yourself, what are other ways, what are other places that I can go to to get uh, evidence? Uh, but at the same time that it creates opportunity, it also creates risk. Because for any kind of, of advanced investi investigation today, uh, as you're looking at a new kind of app like Snapchat or, or Periscope, which I just read about the other day, is some kind of a little app you can use on your, your smartphone, as you look at these new apps, you look at these new uh, devices, you don't have any experience with them. But you know, oh, I might be able to learn something from uh, this. I toy around with it a little bit, and wow, we could start learning some information about the person that we're investigating or the company that we are in investigating. So there's a constant experimentation that goes on. When, when I get my Apple Watch, then I, I'm going to experiment with it, and I'm going to learn about what kinds of evidence does it collect, what kinds of records does it collect. But as an investigator, as a professional who experiments with new devices and applications, I don't know entirely what all the rules are for these new applications and devices. The guidelines that guide me in, in being ethical and complying with law are fuzzy because the technology is so novel, there's so few cases to tell us exactly what should be done with respect to an Apple Watch, for example, that happens to have sensitive information on it, storing information about where a person was or, or who they were talking to at a particular time. And as I evaluate the risks that an investiga investigator encounters, I first acknowledge there are some very important legal boundaries that I need to bear in mind as an investigator who goes into cyberspace to access some kind of evidence or, or records or inf information. And the key legal boundaries are, are uh, these that I've identified here on the, this slide, the major computer crime laws in the United States from the uh, federal laws, uh, the laws that I'll focus on to, uh, today in the uh, crime space, are first the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is a broadly written computer crime law that roughly says that it's a crime to access a computer without authority and cause some kind of a harm. Then there's the eavesdropping laws. And the two major examples of the federal eavesdropping laws are the Wiretap Act and the Stored Communications Act. And broadly speaking, they forbid illicit collection of communications, electronic communications, or recording of communications. Uh, there are exceptions, and there are reasons to uh, uh, be able to collect information under these laws, but you've got to watch out for these kinds of things. One aspect of these computer crime laws that I've just identified that's quite striking is that these are criminal laws, which means that uh, normally they're enforced by the government in the form of the prosecutor uh, indicting someone and taking them to a criminal trial, and you can lose a criminal trial and you go to jail. But there's another way that these laws are enforced, and it's called a private right of action. And what that means is the victim of violation of one of these laws can sue the investigator and get money. And wow, that really opens up a lot of risk. 
And a good example, a striking, maybe a scary example of a private right of action with respect to a cyber investigation, uh, investigation is this uh, Clemens Jeffries uh, case that in, <coughs> involved an uh, investigative company named Absolute Software. Absolute was hired by a school district to put surveillance software on a laptop that belonged to the school district. The laptop was stolen. It was sold to a woman who had no idea that this laptop had been stolen. She had no idea that it had surveillance software on it. And she used it in a way that was not illegal, but in a way that was um, uh, sensational. She used it in, in ways to communicate it ex explicitly with her uh, boyfriend. Well, Absolute Software is the investigation investigator. It turns on the software because the laptop has been stolen, and Absolute, as a good investigator, starts collecting evidence, including webcam evidence, uh, through this uh, laptop. And Absolute doesn't publish this information on Facebook. It takes it to the police. It includes uh, IP address, but includes also some explicit uh, photographs uh, taken from the, the webcam. The police take this information, and they show up at the home of Ms. Clements Jeffrey, and they're indiscreet. The police say things that are embarrassing to her. Then full investigation uh, is concluded. She knew nothing about the stolen laptop. She truly did not believe that, know that the laptop was, was stolen. She was completely innocent. However, she sues Absolute Software saying, you didn't have the right to collect this sensitive inf information uh, from me. And the judge listens to all this, and the judge says, let the jury decide. Wow. Think about this from the point of view of a company named Absolute Software. You have to go to a jury trial to protect yourself from liability for allegedly uh, eavesdropping and violating the eavesdropping laws. As a corporation, you don't want to go to a jury trial. You don't want to defend yourself in public because this is so embarrassing and can create so much negative publicity for your company. What do you do? You settle. You pay her, and that's what Absolute Software did. So it's a, an example of an investigator thinking that it's doing the right thing, collecting evidence, giving it to the police, but still it comes back to haunt the investigator. And this points out that it can be difficult for the cyber investigator to fully anticipate all the laws and the implications of these laws and how they might play out in a particular kind of a, a case. In my class, I teach all kinds of ideas on helping to reduce and manage these kinds of risks. I'll give one example of a way to manage the kind of risk that Absolute Software uh, encountered. I teach that a cyber investigator must exercise restraint and good judgment. And so uh, that's an easy thing for me to say, but it's hard for an investigator to ingest and actually implement that idea Oh, I've got to exercise restraint. I have to exercise good judgment. Oh, I've got very sensitive pictures. I should res refrain from giving them to the police right now because it might look really bad. Okay, there's the lesson, but actually applying that lesson in practice is tough. I have a whole range of uh, uh, tips for managing and reducing risk that I try to teach in my five-day class. Here's some highlights, major ideas of uh, what I call earmarks of legality as you strive to be a good investigator and you strive also uh, to comply with the many different regulations that uh, expect us to be secure in information security. Accountability uh, means that I am not afraid to have records and I'm not afraid to have the records tell the truth so that I can explain in the future what I did as an investigator or as a, an information secu uh, security professional. Deliberation means I was calm, I talked to other people, like my boss or my colleagues, before I made a decision. I thought about it. I was rational about it. Proportionality means that as I evaluate any particular step in an investigation, I want to make sure that what I do is uh, only going as far as necessary with respect to the threat, and I'm not going overboard. I'm not doing more than I, I, I need to do, and if I can show proportionality, and in fact, I'm showing restraint. Warning people in advance is a way to reduce risk, and therefore, on the uh, uh, Clements-Jeffrey case, if the 
school district had a label right there on front of the front of the laptop that says warning this belongs to the school district and we have surveillance software on there then that would have changed the whole case that didn't exist in that particular uh, case so warning people and getting their consent in advance is one way of helping to uh, manage these uh, unexpected or, or um, surprising kinds of risks that can apply as we are experimenting with new technologies and apps and, and uh, new kinds of devices. <clears throat> I'll um, spend a couple of minutes here identifying some other uh, examples of uh, risks that could apply to an investigator in the, the cyber type of world. One other group of risks, apart from directly law, are ethical risks, ethical limitations. And for uh, a lot of investigators today, there are few real good statements of ethical requirements that apply to new kinds of technology like social media or mobile apps. One place to begin learning about ethical rules in this area would be to look at ethical opinions that apply to lawyers. Now, a lot of you guys here who are on this uh, call are not lawyers. Nevertheless, if you hold yourself to a standard that's equivalent to what lawyers should hold themselves to, then you're holding yourself to a high standard. Furthermore, if you can't find particular ethical requirements or opinions that are directly applicable to you, such as, say, you're a private investigator and you're licensed and you're not aware in your state of any particular ethical rules, going to read the ethical opinions that apply to lawyers in your state as well as other lawyers around the country can be a great way to help educate you as an investigator what looks good in the public and what looks bad in the public, what looks like it's ethical and what looks like it's not ethical. So I cite here some opinions that are, are formal opinions written for attorneys with respect to social media investigations. And so, so these opinions that come from the state of New York in the uh, county of uh, San Diego say it's okay for a lawyer working as an investigator, working on a case, to view the public postings of adversaries, like uh, someone that you're going to sue or, or someone you're going to file a, uh, a divorce uh, proceeding against. However, the ethical rules say that it is inappropriate to use deception to friend someone in social media. And therefore, if you're pretending to be an old boyfriend, but you're really not an old boyfriend, so that you can try to friend somebody uh, on Facebook, the legal ethics opinions say don't do that. That's unethical. And from the point of view of an investigator who's not a lawyer, that's a very useful guidepost to help you better understand where are the rules that might apply uh, to me. Furthermore, these rules, even though directly they apply to lawyers, they also apply to people who work for lawyers. And therefore, if you're an investigator who's working under the direction of a lawyer, you and your lawyer need to be aware of ethical uh, limitations like these that I've cited here on, the, uh, on, on, on this uh, slide. This is a, a large field. There are many other opinions applicable to attorneys. And I recommend you become familiar with this uh, topic, even if you're not an attor uh, attorney. Another um, a risk is terms of service. And I'm going to do something here. I'm going to go back, and I want to make sure I didn't skip a slide, because the slides move kind of quick. Terms of service can include end-user license agreement when you install an app on your iPhone. It can include the terms on a website. It can include the terms that apply to uh, some kind of a forum that you access. Uh, through uh, a mobile app or uh, 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 through um, a, a social media site. So you might go to Facebook, for example. And Facebook has terms, and we'll talk about their terms of service here in a moment. But then while you're in Facebook, you may go to a certain app. In Facebook, and maybe you're on the web, but as you go into that app, there could well be terms of service that apply inside that app. I'm alerting you pay attention to these terms of service, these end user license agreements. Those are contracts. And they often say something like, if you come to my website, you agree to by contract to these terms. And those terms can be relevant to investigators. 
a very good case in this field is this True Beginnings case that I have cited on this slide. In the True Beginnings case, the investigator is working for the owner of a patent. So the investigator is trying to figure out whether Spark, Spark Network is violating the patent, the intellectual property. And Spark Network runs uh, online dating sites. <clears throat> so the investigator goes into the online dating site and gets an account. And the investigator looks around inside the online dating site. When the investigator got the account, terms of service applied. Sometimes those terms of service are something you have to click on, but sometimes they'll apply just automatically. Just There'll just be a little link down at the bottom of the page that says, when you uh, uh, enter this service, these terms of service apply to you. I'm suggesting be very aware of those terms of service. And so the, the investigator goes into the online dating site and sees evidence that the dating site violates the patent. So the investigator makes screenshots. Then the <coughs> owner of the patent sues Spark Network saying, you violated my, my patents, you owe me money. Now Spark came back and says, there were terms of service on our website. They applied to you. And they prevented you from conducting an investigation or making screenshots. The court read the terms of service. It's like reading any kind of contract. The court just starts reading the words of the, the contract. And the, the contract did not really clearly say, if you're an investigator, you have to go away. It, the contract did not clearly say, if you're an investigator, you can't make screenshots. What the contract said was merely, you may use this site only for personal purposes. And so the court read that only for personal purposes. OK, is an investigation with screenshots for a patent personal purposes. The court said that terms of service can, in fact, forbid an investigator from engaging in her work. However, the court interpreted the particular words of the terms of service in this case and said, these terms of service do not uh, forbid the investigator from doing what he did, therefore, the evidence is allowed in. We're not going to kick out the uh, screenshot. One of the things we do a lot in my class uh, at SANS is we talk a lot about writing words and writing your words accurately. And here was a great example of a website owner not writing the words that he really wanted, and therefore his words failed when he got to court. But the real reason I'm teaching this case is watch out for terms of service, because when you go visit an app, that app may well have terms that apply to you and may limit what you as an investigator are doing. Take a look at the legal terms of Facebook. I'm quoting from Facebook's legal terms that apply to everybody who uses Facebook, including an investigator. It says, if you collect information from users, you will obtain their consent. Really? You have to obtain their consent? What if you're an investigator going to look on the public part of a, a web page of uh, the timeline of a user on Facebook. You're looking at the public timeline of a user, and you're just there looking. Well, according to, and for the purpose of gathering some evidence, like taking some notes or making a screenshot, according to the literal words of Facebook, you have to get that guy's consent first. Wow, that's a pretty broad statement, because I might be an investigator working for a divorce lawyer, and I'm looking at our adversary, who's the spouse against whom we're going to file the divorce, and I don't want the spouse to know that I'm looking at the spouse's page, because we haven't even told the spouse that we're going to file the lawsuit or the, the, the divorce. Well, this, in its literal terms, says I have to get consent. That's a very interesting concern. And um, my larger message here is that as you go around on web pages and mobile apps, you see many kinds of terms of service that might limit an investigator's work. Now, I've been making a lot of noise about these terms of service on Facebook for a couple of years, and I've not seen anyone actually invoke those terms of service in a lawsuit yet. And maybe if one of you has seen that, I'd love to know about it. Uh, and, and what happens, and I'll show you some cases here, in truth, uh, evidence from social media like Facebook is used all the time in lawsuits and in criminal investigations. And so far, I've not seen anyone 
raising these broad terms at Facebook or similar social media sites as a way of getting evidence uh, kicked out. Uh, but I, I, I raise that as a concern. I don't believe that these broadly written terms at Facebook are necessarily going to prevent investigators and police officers from and prosecutors from using evidence from uh, uh, Facebook where they collect a screenshot or, or uh, something without the prior consent of the uh, user. It's very, very common that Facebook and, and other kinds of social media evidence are used in um, all, all kinds of investigations and lawsuits. However, I uh, believe that the investigator is wise to recognize this theoretical risk and therefore be restrained in what he does. And uh, restraint includes, I'm only going to look at what's necessary for the case. I'm not going to look at a whole bunch of other stuff that's un unrelated to the case. That's consistent with an idea called proportionality. Uh, proportionality means I only go as far as necessary, and I don't go any farther than necessary. Today, social media evidence is very, very commonly used in all kinds of legal proceedings, stretching from criminal uh, uh, prosecutions to uh, much less formal uh, proceedings, such as a proceeding in a family court, where the family court judge holds a lower standard for admitting evidence and considering evidence. As many of you know, the standard for uh, prosecuting someone with evidence in a criminal trial in the United States is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's a very strong standard, a very high standard. But in other uh, uh, legal proceedings, such as family court, the standard can be much lower. And a family law judge may say, I don't need proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, I'm not going to be a very, have a, a, a very uh, heavy filter as to what evidence is presented to me. I'm a family judge, and I'm trying to protect children. So show me the evidence, and, and I'll make a decision on whether it's uh, credible or, or not. And therefore, the use of social media evidence and other kinds of cyber evidence varies tremendously across our legal system. And today, a lot of cyber evidence is used uh, in all kinds of in, in investigation, all kinds of uh, lawsuits. I do note some criminal courts expressing skepticism about some social media evidence. And so this LA case is a, an example of a criminal court that would not allow a Facebook message to be admitted uh, because the court said, well, how do I know that that Facebook message actually came from the person in question who was a, a, a witness? How do I know that someone didn't steal their password, for example? And the court raises a legitimate concern around authentication of social media e evidence. But if you were in a family court, uh, for example, it's very possible the family court would not have taken such a, a, a strict uh, interpretation of uh, the requirement for, for evidence where the family court would say, I don't need evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. Just let me see the Facebook messages and I'll e evaluate it. Uh, so as you are uh, collecting uh, evidence from new novels, uh, uh, cyber places, such as social media, such as online games, and, uh, such as uh, mobile apps, you are wise to be thinking about how would I help the judge figure out or the jury figure out that this information is what it claims uh, to be? How do I help to show that this message really did come from uh, John Doe, who is the, the target of the investigation? And there can be a, a wide range of techniques. Uh, you might interact with the user. For example, notice I put in parentheses, if permitted, because in some circumstances, uh, you might not be permitted. Uh, by ethical uh, or other uh, uh, limitations. But interaction might be uh, you see a message on Facebook that says, I'm going to beat up Sally. So you send a, a text message by phone to the target of the investigation. Say, really? Did you intend to say that you're going to beat up Sally? And you get a text message back from the, the target. Say, yeah, I intend on beating up Sally. OK, now you're getting evidence from two different directions. And therefore, you may be corroborating the original evidence on Facebook and being able to do a better job of helping to show to the judge and the jury that, in fact, this evidence really was authenticated. This Tienda case illustrates that not all criminal cases are the same. Not every civil law case is the same. So that a criminal court uh, 
in the Elliott case, as I saw, we saw a few minutes earlier, uh, stated skepticism about the authenticity of something out of Facebook. In the Tienda case, the defendant in a criminal case was a heavy user of MySpace. And the defendant had lots of pictures, pictures of himself, pictures of his buddies. He had lots of incriminating statements on Facebook and all this, uh, MySpace, and all of this evidence of pictures and statements and timestamps and video and so on, it all self-corroborated. Uh, it, so it all brought the uh, information together to help show this was the guy. And, and therefore, it's authentic enough for the court to accept it. So it's just an example of, an, of another criminal court saying, I'll accept uh, the social media evidence because it's, it's authenticated by the uh, uh, logic of the uh, social media site and the connection of the individual to the site. I want to bring your attention to another major event in technology from the perspective of law and professionals. Like you uh, investigators like me, uh, a lawyer. And that is, I argue, and I, I will try to document this, that technology holds all professionals, all enterprises, all citizens to a higher standard of accountability and legal compliance. And therefore, I argue to professionals like those listening to this webcast that you are wise to be thinking, hmm, I need to make sure that I'm honest. I need to make sure that if anybody reviews, one of these days in the future, my work, that I didn't engage in any white lies. I didn't break the rules or bend the rules someplace. Whereas you might have uh, known from experience, oh, back in the 1990s, I could get away with that little white lie, and nobody would know about it. Nobody will ever find it. There's no records on that kind of thing. But I argue in 2015, 2016, the world is different. And we need to be thinking about the multitude of little records that are being created about every little thing we do that can be used against us uh, by an adversary or by the police or uh, by, by uh, your employer one of these days who's looking back at what you did. A fascinating story in this area is a story about uh, some uh, former police officers and firefighters in New York who had claimed disability. And these people, about 100 different people, had uh, 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 claimed fraudulently that they were disabled. And these cases dated back to as early as 1988. The world in 2014, 2015 is very different from the world of 1988. In 1988, did you have to worry about people taking pictures of you and putting it out on the web? No, you didn't. In 1988, pictures were printed out on little pieces of paper that we stored in a photo album. But they weren't pictures, uh, the things that we captured just with little phones that we car carried uh, around. And so these people, through many years, claim disability fraudulently, and then they live their lives. And they go on in their lives from 1988 to 1990 to 1995 to 2003, 2004, and so on. And, and then as, as you get up into 2010, 2011, imagine that you're a former police officer who illegally claimed disability, and you're really not disabled. Might you start getting concerned in 2010 and 2011 about grandchildren making pictures and videos of you? You might go, oh, no, kids, don't be making pictures of me, because I don't want pictures of me uh, uh, up on uh, uh, Facebook or something like that. Uh, that might show that I actually am not disabled. And what investigators ultimately uncovered in 2013 was uh, an explosion of evidence coming out of social media, where you go onto Facebook and start looking around for these people, and inevitably there are pictures out there and videos out there of these people out having a great time, out exercising, out engaged in deep sea fishing. So there was a photograph of a former police officer who was disabled, but he was out deep sea fishing. He had captured this enormous fish, and there was a picture of him out on Facebook holding this 50, 60 pound fish. Well, if he can hold a 50, 60 pound fish and catch the thing, is he really disabled? But what happened was uh, the in investigators <coughs> found all these people, found them through largely social media, and, 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 and then, of course, prosecuting them for fraud. But my point is, the world changes. 
the world wasn't the same in 2014 as it was in, in 1988. Also, the world is going to be different in 2017, 2018, 2019, as investigators of all sorts, who might be your adversary, who might be your opponent, can get more evidence about what you did. A stunning story comes from a partner at KPMG named Scott London. He was a high partner at KPMG. He uh, had uh, access to a lot of very sensitive evidence, uh, information about his clients because he audited large public companies. And Scott London had a lot of experience. He thought that insider investigations, insider uh, trading investigations, only got to people who were making a lot of money. And his experience dated from the 1990s. Unfortunately, his experience was not up to date with the way things work in uh, 2011, 2012, 2013. And therefore, Scott was giving tips to his buddy. And they were tips to just make a few bucks using insider trading, insider information. And so Scott thought, oh, they'll never catch this. It's too small. The SEC just doesn't have that tiny filter to ca capture a little fish who is using insider tr uh, trading. The world has changed. The Securities and Exchange Commission now uses what we call big data to even find little insider tra uh, tra traders, find little patterns of illegal uh, behavior. So the Securities and Exchange Commission sends a subpoena to the, the little investor who's the buddy of Scott. And the subpoena says, you have some unusual trades. Explain to us how you made these trades. Trades, And so the little investor calls his KPMG buddy, Scott. Hey, I got a subpoena. What should I do? Scott, using his old experience that, ah, they can't prove anything. Just don't give them anything. They can't prove it, he said. Hmm. The little investigator goes to a lawyer. And the little, uh, I mean, the little uh, investor goes to a lawyer. His lawyer goes, wow, that subpoena, that's an important thing. And you know what? The world is different today than it was 10 years ago because you, the little investor, investor, you have lots of text messages on your phone that show that you were in, doing insider trading. Oh, there's a lot of new evidence against you. You know what you need to do? You need to go to the government, fall on your hands and knees, apologize, and become state's witness. And therefore, the little investor uh, snitched on, on uh, his uh, friend, the uh, partner at KPMG, and the friend at KPMG goes to jail. But my point is, the partner at KPMG had assumed that the Securities and Exchange Commission could not investigate him and could not get the evidence uh, against him. He's wrong because evidence is different than it was today. First, it's big data that the Securities and Exchange Commission can find looking through massive quantities of, of records. And second, the records are on mobile phones, they're in email, they're in text messages, they're on the Apple Watch, and therefore there's more, much more evidence for the Securities and Exchange Commission to go after today than there was in the past. Similar idea applies to Swiss bank secrecy. For years, we assume, assumed Swiss bank secrecy was rock solid. But the world has changed. And a key reason is because government like the Internal Revenue Service has been able to use big data to find people who use Swiss bank accounts to evade taxes. And so there are stories like these I've, I've identified here where government uh, uh, uses homeland security data to look at the uh, patterns of behavior of Swiss bankers when they come to the United States. They claim to be on vacation. But if you look at uh, their patterns of behavior over long periods of time, uh, uh, many uh, of these bankers in many different places, you find that actually there was a pattern of them coming systematically to the United States to uh, uh, take uh, a bank account money from U.S. citizens who were trying to evade taxes, and this blows the lid off of the Swiss bank uh, secrecy program to help people evade their uh, taxes. An example of technology also having a large impact on Swiss bank secrecy and things like that is this example from Liechtenstein. Um, leakers like Edward Snowden can steal your enterprise secret information and then give it to the authorities, unlike in the past. And so Liechtenstein is uh, uh, known as, as being a tax haven, similar to what Sweden, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Switzerland was uh, known for being. And what happened is that 
a IT guy who works for a Liechtenstein bank steals the secret information about the secret clients and sells it to the German tax authorities. Well, that kind of thing wasn't easy to do back in the 1990s. It's a lot easier to do that kind of thing uh, today. And therefore, it's much harder for secrets like the identity of clients in uh, Swiss banks or Liechtenstein banks uh, to, to, to be kept a secret. It's easier for that information to get out. And it will be easier in the future for that type of thing to get out. Another aspect of technology changing the way investigations works with respect to the Swiss bank privacy uh, comes from a story related to a Swiss lawyer. The Swiss lawyer had helped American taxpayers hide their Swiss bank accounts. But the IRS got enough information about him to say, we're going to prosecute you. And he said, all right, I'd rather uh, plead guilty and get a lower sentence than to fight you. So he pled guilty, and he says, I agreed to cooperate entirely with the Internal Revenue Service. He had been working for years for rich Americans who were putting their money in Swiss banks to evade taxes. And when he says, I'm going to cooperate with the IRS, what evidence starts to come to the IRS? Not just what he knows in his head. It's not just the paper records that he has in his file cabinet. Now it's his phone, it's his email account, it's his computer. All of these very detailed records fall into the hands of the Internal Revenue Service. And from the point of view of these clients who for years thought that they had attorney-client privilege, they had secrecy from this lawyer, Suddenly, they're on a sinking ship, and they realize, whoa, my lawyer in Switzerland just gave his hard drive to the Internal Revenue Service. Wow, I need uh, to come in and, and, and pay my taxes and apologize to the IRS, and I might find myself going to jail. Thus, I argue that because of changes in technology, all investigators are wise, including lawyers like myself. Hold yourself to the highest standards. Don't uh, give in to the temptation to violate a law, to violate uh, ethical re requirements in order to win a case or, or advance your client's needs. So I'll cite a little story here uh, from a private investigator who recently pled guilty to hiring hackers to, to hack into email accounts. And the private investigator appeared to have been working under lawyers to help win some uh, lawsuits related to insurance claims. Uh, and I can see the temptation of a private investigator. Oh, boy, sure would be cool if we just tinkered around a little bit with these e email accounts of the people under investigation. We have to find a lot of valuable information. Don't succumb to the temptation. My concern is that if you engage in these types of uh, bending the rules, violating the law, that eventually you're going to get caught. There's more evidence out there about what you did and when you did it that can be used against you, and it might sit out there and, and not come back to haunt you until 10 years later. There is a temptation, even among well-meaning people, even um, among uh, very responsible people like you and me, to, oh, have little white lies, oh, a little bit of deception. And today, that kind of attitude is riskier than it was in the past fascinating example. Recently, there was an investigation at the University of Texas where the Board of Regents asks the president of the University of Texas, do you, the president, give uh, <clears throat> uh, special accommodations to students who don't have good credentials but who are connected politically or uh, connected by, by money? And the, the president wasn't forthcoming about this. He didn't give candid answers to this. There was a deep investigation. Ultimately, the University Board of Regents learned, yes, University of Texas uh, president's office allows some 70 kids a year into the University of Texas because they have connections. And so the president, he resigns, and he finally admits, yes, I've been doing this. And he, he had rationalized in his head that there was a good reason to do what he was doing. He said, well, it was in the best interest of the university that I uh, accommodate people who are politically connected or have a lot of money. And he said, everybody does it. Well, that's an easy rationalization. And, and for a lot of professionals or executives, it's easy to rationalize. Everybody does it. But I'm suggesting it's harder to get away with it today than it was in years in the past. So a uh, few other ideas here on managing risk. Uh, in your, where you're in some kind of investigation. Let's say that you have, you're running a human resources type of investigation internal to your, your enterprise. Uh, a lot of guys at SANS 
uh, you say, okay, we're going to investigate this person. The first thing you do is you start going around and grabbing evidence, uh, maybe on their phone, maybe out of their uh, email, maybe off their computer, and, and, and so on. However, I argue that there can be risks to grabbing uh, too much evidence too quickly, and arguments that you um, had uh, infringed on the privacy of an employee or, or that you looked at evidence that you, sh you shouldn't have looked at. Here's an idea. Uh, in, instead of immediately grabbing a lot of electronic data, you might start with a preservation letter, which I'll explain in the next couple of slides. The preservation letter says to the, the, to the, uh, the target of the investigation, we're inv investigating you. Don't delete any records. That puts a lot of pressure on the target of the investigation, because if she starts deleting records, she's digging a hole for herself. Then, after with a preservation letter, you say, don't delete records, then have an interview where you sit the uh, person down and you're taking notes and you start asking them plenty of questions. Did you do this? Did you say this other bad thing to John? And, and, and so on. If they lie, they're digging a hole for themselves. But it's very possible in a modern investigation, a modern in interview, the subject knows, you know what, there's ultimately records that can be found out there that will implicate me, therefore I better tell the truth. And that can be a much softer way of getting to the truth rather than immediately grabbing an awful lot of evidence, maybe off of uh, uh, Facebook, for example. So uh, what's a preservation letter? A preservation letter is a formal statement by an investigator, which could be the employer, that says, we have some reason to believe that, you, that there's something to investigate here. We have reason to believe you may have evidence, such as on Facebook or on your personal phone, and you should not delete that uh, uh, evidence. So that preservation letter can put quite a bit of pressure on the data subject in the, um, in the, the investigation subject in the modern age. And I argue that modern investigations in 2015, 2016 are different because the quantities of electronic evidence are so much greater than they were 10 years ago. Final thought for managing risk related to cyber investigations is work with your attorney under appropriate circumstances, guided by your attorney, your attorney can say, we will open an investigation on the topic about whether John said something to Sally. Then the attorney can cloak the investigation under what's known as attorney work product. An attorney work product is a little phrase you can look up on, on Google. We talk a lot about it in my course. Attorney work product is like attorney-client privilege it cloaks confidentiality around something. So an attorney leading an investigation can say, uh, I'm opening the investigation under attorney work product, and then she could commission you to go gather the evidence. Well, your work, gathering the evidence, your investigation is normally cloaked under confidentiality, and therefore it helps uh, to ensure that you do an investigation, but you don't have to turn over the investigation to your adversary in court one of these days in the uh, future. Uh, this attorney work product confidentiality does not excuse, excuse illegal activity, and it doesn't uh, prevent ultimately the underlying uh, source evidence from being turned over, but it does protect the uh, direction of your investigation. And so this comes to the conclusion of my uh, prepared remarks. You see I've got a website, benjaminwright.us, which links to my blogs. And recently, uh, just like yesterday, I posted a new blog art article that's related to the to topics we've discovered, discussed here. So I would be thrilled if uh, some of you would come and look at my blogs and read uh, articles that I've uh, written and uh, uh, leave comments. Also, i am just remind you, what I've said here is not legal advice. Uh, if you need legal advice, you should consult a uh, lawyer. Uh, but at this time, I'd like to uh, uh, switch over and see if there's any questions that have come in from the audience. You can see here in the, the bottom slide, the bottom of this slide, uh, places and times where we'll be teaching Legal 523 live later this year. So uh, Ben White, uh, do we have any uh, questions? Yes, uh, I've posted the questions for you in your uh, chat window. OK. Um, I'm going to, I'm scrolling through these. I saw one question. I'm going to, frankly, I'm going to say to the person who asked it, it said, the question says, where does parallel construction fit in with holding yourself to higher standards? The answer is, I don't know what parallel construction is. If you can give me more information, maybe I can answer it. Then uh, there's a question that says, if a malicious actor is trespassing on your equipment, are there any gotchas? 
to monitoring their activities or allowing other entities to monitor these, uh, these activities. Uh, okay, my interpretation of a gotcha is, okay, guy, hacker is on my equipment. Uh, I'm monitoring him. I'm gathering evidence uh, in him. Could I, the investigator, get in trouble? Here's an argument, a concern. And that concern is that the laws of all countries in the world could apply all at once to this event. And you don't know where this bad guy is from. You don't know what country he's from. You don't know what his, uh, the rules of uh, uh, criminal laws are in his country. And therefore, there is the theoretical risk that as you're capturing evidence that maybe you're violating an eavesdropping law in his local country. It's a theoretical possibility. And thus, one of the things that I like to do is use uh, terms of service on my equipment and my equipment says, if you come to my equipment, like my honeypot, you agree to me monitoring you and capturing evidence about you. And so it's a, a way to help contain the theoretical risk that otherwise I violated his, uh, his right to uh, privacy. We talk a lot about that in my uh, class. OK, I've got another question. It says, comment, if I were a defense attorney, I would argue that you, the state, agreed to the terms of service of Facebook, and then you violated my client's rights by not following terms of service and notify him. Uh, who, uh, yes, I agree with you. You and I perfectly agree. If anybody has seen an example of a case like that, of someone raising terms of service from Facebook to prevent evidence from being used in a criminal trial or a civil court, send me an email. I want to know about it. I've never seen it. I agree with the commenter. That is my interpretation that it could be used, but I can't, I can't find the case yet. I've been looking around. OK, uh, next, regarding Facebook authentication, has it been my experience that this is rarely challenged and the evidence gets in under Rule 901, the witness uh, collection and credibility? OK, M my experience is that a lot of social media evidence does get in. There are larger challenges in criminal investigations. But I showed, you, I showed you two criminal cases. I showed you one criminal case, which is the, the Ellick case. I just used it as an example where that criminal court says, no, the Facebook evidence doesn't get in. But then I showed you the Tienda case, another criminal case, social media evidence, court says it gets in. I don't see a uniformity against, across all of the courts of America. This is all too new. I don't know where the big trends are. A lot of social media evidence is used in the courtroom, but there could be higher standards, especially in criminal cases. Next question is long. Do you have any comments for investigators that straddle, straddle US and Canadian jurisdictions? Uh, we all in cyberspace straddle all of the jurisdictions of the world at the same time. So it's not just Canada and US, even though you may be dealing with pe people in Canada. Theoretically, you can be dealing with all the laws of the world. And therefore, the, the theoretical risks are very, very challenging. And it, you never know who's going to claim that some particular law in Brazil uh, applies, even though you said, I didn't know the guy was in uh, Brazil. OK, then the question goes on. It says, can you have terms of service for corporate applications data that apply to employees that are not included in the employee handbook? Yes! Terms of service is just a contract. Where can you put a contract? Anywhere you want to. How do you write a contract? With plain English. State it. Yes, contracts are very Contract law is a very flexible way to achieve what you're trying to do and a very flexible way to manage your risk. And you can use it in an infinite number of ways and places um, uh, in your um, uh, enterprise or in your professional work. Next question here, it says, what if the employee handbook is contradictory to the terms of service? Answer, don't do that. Make sh try to make your terms of service consistent with the employee handbook. And when you state multiple terms, multiple rules, multiple policies, and they're inconsistent with each other, I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but you've got a problem. Don't do that. That's one of the lessons I try to teach in my, my class. Um, OK. Here's the question. Is, quote, cause harm, close quote, part of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act honored in the breach by prosecutors? I'm not sure I follow that. Uh, and this cause harm thing is a paraphrase. I don't have time to go through all the details of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. It is a, it's a broad, broad um, overall 
discussion that I've provided here of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, but I don't, I don't understand your question. Uh, okay, I, now let's, let me see if any new questions. I, I went all the way, I went from the bottom to the top. Um, okay, let's see a new question. It says, work product privilege is a compelling reason to do the work for the attorney and not the client. Okay, I kind of follow that. Often, the attorneys forget this and try to establish privity of contract between the investigator and the attorney's client in order not to be on the hook for the bill if not paid. Well, that's a very interesting comment. It sounds like it's from a lawyer, and I'll accept the comment. But I don't think it's telling. I don't think it's asking me a question. Okay, next que question. What is the issue with using third-party purveyors of social media data, e.g., Twitter? I don't know what you mean. Third party purveyor. Um, I, I don't follow the question. Um, next question. Have you seen occasion where evidence was collected or requested from a cloud application or a cloud based company? Answer yes. Okay, then now it's going on to the next part of the question. It says, if so, does the location of that cloud based equipment and those cloud based files uh, relevant or particularly significant? Yes, yes. And so, uh, for example, Microsoft right now is in a major protracted lawsuit with the United States Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is Microsoft. You are a cloud provider. You are a U.S.-based company. You have a cloud server in Ireland. The evidence is in Ireland. And we, the United States Department of Justice, the prosecutors in the United States, we want the evidence that's in Ireland. It's on your server in Ireland. And the Department of Justice says, we order you, Microsoft, to go get the evidence in Ireland. Now, Microsoft says, no, that evidence is subject to Irish law, not U.S. law. And uh, a, a lower federal court ruled in favor of the Department of Justice that says, Microsoft, go get the evidence out of Ireland. Microsoft is appealing and saying, no, it should not be U.S. law, and the U.S. authorities cannot order me, the service provider, to go get the evidence out of Ireland because the, the law of Ireland applies. Huge topic. The basic answer is we are just barely touching this field, and it is uh, we'll see a lot of litigation and confusion over this topic in the future about whose law applies to evidence that's in the cloud out there someplace. Next question. How about for public websites that have been closed and no consent is presented? Is that information legally available? Uh, watch out. When you, I, I don't, you've got to look at the fact pattern for a particular case. So the, this person who's asked me a question, as I interpret the question, says, okay, so there's a closed website. And then somehow I, the investigator, get into the website and collect information. Did I do something wrong? Did I do something right? I don't know. It, it depends on the circumstances. Uh, there might be an argument that says that you accessed records that you were not entitled to access. A lot of it uh, revolves around authority. What was your authority? And how do you determine authority? Through uh, who owned the website, uh, what did they say to you, when, what were the purposes for giving you an account to log into the site, and that thing. Next question. I am understanding that under work product doctrine, this is where we are investigating something in particular for a client intended for litigation engaged in a, a client's attorney. Or, this is a long question, and it looks like it's a lawyer, and I'm probably not going to be able to parse this question. And it says, or, are you suggesting we are using our own counsel when on assignment just clarifying? I, I, it's too complex of a question, and I, it, 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 I can't get into it. Sorry. If, next question, if the event happened in the U.S., oh, Okay, it happened. It's a cyber event that happened in the U.S. You can be, you can say I'm being a little sarcastic. Okay, if the event happened in in U.S., will a foreign country execute a sentence issued by a tribunal in USA for civil lawsuits? Ans okay, the, the 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 answer is I can have a judgment from a court in the United States. But the people who owe me money are in England or the UK or Japan. Can I take my judgment to Japan and enforce it against the guy who owes me money? The answer is very possibly yes, but it's hard. It's a big, it's a difficult topic, but a very possibly yes. Next question. 
Okay, this is a long, looks like it's a long one, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get into it because, you know, you ask these long, some of these questions, it's just too much to do through chat and, and um, a, a webcam. Um, okay, it's the last question, and we're getting to the end, so I'm going to do my best to get into this. It says, facts. Employee code of ethics prohibits, quote, unauthorized recordings, close quote. Okay, got that. Then it goes on to say, not otherwise defined. Okay, so code of ethics prohibits unauthorized recordings of an, by an employee. Then the next sentence says, in the absence of definition of who authorizes or how authorizes, is it reasonable to look to state law and or ethics opinion? <laughs> it's always reasonable to look to state law. It's also reasonable to look to federal law. It's also reasonable to look at to ethic opinions. So. I think the answer is you got to look at all the relevant laws, rules, regulations, guidelines, opinions. All of these things could be uh, relevant. So to, or, to whoever asked the question, the mere fact that there is some rule that's written in an employee handbook does not somehow prevent federal law from applying, state law from applying, foreign law from applying, or some kind of ethics from an appropriate authority from applying. I think that's the answer to your question. I have the top of the hour. And so I'm going to say it's been an honor to interact with you. I blog a lot. Uh, I, I, uh, it'd be a, a lot of fun for you guys, you people, to come into my, my blogs and uh, argue with me and tell me where I'm wrong or tell me about cases that I'm, I'm not aware of. But I'm going to close out and say thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Ben, for your great presentation and for taking the time to bring this great content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, you can visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Till next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.